Well, actually, Steve White, who had acquired this crazy book about a garage sale where all the items were sold, and each one that went to different places would carry with it a story of possession and, and horror, written by a guy named John Jones, I believe. One time while writing the, the, uh, the first Amityville I wrote, which was, which was It's About Time, um, I was confused at one point because I was reading his book and I noticed that these inanimate objects that had been sold at a garage sale, in one instance they, pos- they, they, they would possess people and make them do evil things. And then there was another instance where they actually reached out and hit somebody, like the object hit somebody. And so I remember calling this author who was like based in Australia or something and I go, so let me understand, do, do these things possess or do they, do they actually have agency that they can hit? Because I, I, I'm, I'm having trouble reconciling this. I remember he goes, he, like, he was like chewing tobacco or something. He was like, yep, Chris, that's the way evil is. It's just unpredictable. The book was bought by this guy named Steve White, who's a producer. And uh, his first version of the movie was the one he did with Patty Duke. And it was for NBC, for television. And I think what Steve realized immediately was that uh, there was incredible limitations about what you could do on TV. Now, this is, in, this is horror films at a time, like, before there were, there were, you know, everything was just about the blood and guts. And so there was a lot of suspense in the one for NBC, but ultimately it didn't pay off. And so he made the wise choice of rolling over to try and make uh, some small features that would have the leeway and the ratings capacity to carry uh, what you need from a horror film. At the time that we started these two, how I got involved was I had been working for Steve in one capacity, and then um, I had been trying to produce some movies with him but he had been uninterested. And so then I offered, I said, well, what if I write the Amityville movies for you? Because I, I was a good writer, but I was really trying to be a producer. So in effect, I wrote the scripts as a way to get myself on as a producer. So Antonio was a, uh, a guy I had worked with in San Francisco. He was kind of a, a very good artist, a very good illustrator. And uh, he had written a script called Slayer that I had liked before. So I brought him in to help write. I haven't talked to Tony in a while. That's what happens in this business. You kind of move different directions. But um, he was a really strong artist with a very dark sensibility. So if there's darker moments in those movies, I can safely attribute to him. So Republic Pictures was an independent studio, distribution entity. They had come about in the time when, uh, you know, all of this was riding the wave of direct-to-home video uh, that was driving a lot of independent films that that in sort of the typical fashion would have a home entertainment or home video release in the United States and then a foreign release uh, in theatrical around the world. And Republic found exactly how that business model worked. They jumped right in the middle of it. They made a lot of movies. Uh, They were a studio that was based, I think, in Marina del Rey, they had a couple of really great executives who were really supportive, and I think adventurous. I mean, you look at uh, you look at the it's about time, uh, and it's a, it's a it's a kind of a crazy movie, and you have to you, know, you can imagine someone had to read that script and supported it. So I give I, hats off to Republic for doing that. In fact, I don't think they ever understood the movie the whole time we were doing it. But these things carry with them so much momentum, right? You get going and you got dates and the budgets are tight, so you can't sit around and kind of, you know, go to coffee and talk about script very often. Tony's, Tony's a terrific guy. When I met Tony, he had just come off Hellraiser 2, which was a uh, pretty hardcore horror film. And I think he was looking to do something that would maybe put him in position more in, you know, mainstream filmmaking. And so uh, we went out and did uh, It's About Time, which is going to be, uh, you know, a kind of a, a reasonably conventional storytelling with a family stuck in a haunted house. But Tony's a very quiet guy. He has a really clear idea what he wants to do. Uh, I enjoyed working with him a lot. <laughs> the things you remember about a production are either they go into the category of great achievements or colossal mistakes. The mistakes always come to mind. Um, we were shooting a scene. There's a scene in that movie where um, one of our characters is stuck in the bathtub and it's about to, the bathtub overflows as they're about to be, be murdered. Um, and so we shot that in a house in Calabasas and we decided to actually do the gag of an overflowing bathtub for real, just in a bathtub and let it overflow. It sounded like a smart idea. Um, it's a terrible idea. Bathrooms are not designed to accommodate overflowing water to the degree you need to make a movie. So we let water overflow the whole time, and we wrapped it. And the doubters in the crew, 
you know, went, wow, that really worked. That's pretty great. And those of us who are advocates said, see, sometimes you just got to do what it takes. On cue, the floor collapsed and the uh, bathroom, the bathtub fell from the second floor to the first floor there. And we weren't rolling camera, unfortunately, at the time. But uh, so I remember that really well. That was a huge mess. It's true, though, about dogs. This guy at school once brought a corner. There's speaker. a scene where we, yeah, the, the camera the moves as the characters go into one room, and then when they, they, they come back, when I mean, all the furniture has been changed. And uh, we did that practically, that in camera. Uh, we had 10 people standing by who had to work very quickly in about, it's about 17 seconds to completely redress the room. It, nobody does that stuff anymore. It was just, it was uh, very analog, very in camera. Financially, it was successful. Uh, I think creatively, it was very successful. I actually think it's a really good script and a good movie. It was taken reasonably seriously. We took it to a film festival in Milan, the Dylan Dog Film Festival. We got notices, and for a little while, we were right in the, in the, living in the center of, uh, certainly creatively in the center of the horror film genre for a year there. Uh, I thought it was very successful. <laughs> you know, from a horror film standpoint, the fun of writing that movie was being able to say, Okay, they, we used to talk about movies in reels, 10 reels. And I remember we said, okay, there has to be a fantastic shot in every reel, and someone has to get brutally murdered in every reel or something close to that. And so it was kind of fun to write that way and go like, look, it work. it's been 10 minutes since somebody really has, has come under the knife. So we'll have to engineer a way for that to happen. It's a very different way of writing. It's a little bit like writing an action film. You know, the same thing, you have sort of this clockwork you have to hit. And so I felt like in that movie we did a really good job of addressing that, but at the same time winding through what I thought was a fairly relatable and even emotional story. <laughs>